Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 347 on Now You Know. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's episode. Magic Spoon is a cereal you can enjoy anytime to power through your day. The creators experimented for over a year to recreate your favorite childhood cereals. The formula tastes just like you remember, but now with more protein, less sugar, and no artificial ingredients. Magic Spoon is great for a low-carb lifestyle, so each cereal has 13 to 14 grams of protein, 4 to 5 grams of net carbs, and 0 grams of sugar per serving. Magic Spoon has a lot of options to choose from, like the best-selling cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry muffin, and maple waffle. Plus other awesome flavors, including honey nut and cinnamon roll, along with birthday cake that has now been permanently added to the Magic Spoon collection. Um, by the way, who finished the cocoa without asking? I don't know. What, you finished this one too? Maybe. Magic Spoon is backed with 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Try it and I bet you'll never want to go back to regular cereal again. Click the link below and use the code NYK for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com NYK today. So Tesla keeps tweaking the prices. I'm tweaking. This time to the Model Y. The standard Model Y has seating for five people. The seven seat option, so adding a third row with two additional seats, was priced at $4,000 extra, but Tesla just reduced that to $3,000. Wait, am I crazy? Or was the seven seat option originally offered at $3,000 um, when the Model Y came out and then Tesla raised the price to $4,000 earlier this year? You're not crazy. See, this is what Tesla does. They look at the sales data and they look at the production data and then they tweak prices. So basically, if I'm remembering correctly, the three row seat Model Y is now pretty much the same exact price as it was back in the spring of 2021. Yeah, I think that's right. So you can now get the seven seat Model Y for $52,990 before destination fees and before the $7,500 federal tax credit. Right, because you have to buy the long range variant to get seven seats. You can't get seven seats on the rear wheel drive version. So remember when everyone was all upset about the Model S and X refresh being shipped out with only the yoke steering wheel? Yeah. And then you remember how the round steering wheel came out and everyone was upset about it costing extra? Yeah. Uh, well, yokes on them. The round steering wheel is now standard. It seems like Tesla has a real roundabout way of steering their customers. Uh, first, they offer the yoke for free and everyone yokes about it. Then they charge extra for the round wheel and people get round up. Now they're making the round wheel standard and charging extra for the yoke and people are feeling steering mad. So are you upset about this? Because I feel like some people are getting way too upset about it. Yeah, I mean, people still seem to be upset that the yoke is even an option. Uh, but I think that this brings up a bigger question about the Cybertruck. Will it have a wheel or will it have a yoke? Ah, I kind of think if I'm going to do any trailering, I'm going to want a wheel. But that's just me. I still think you should be able to get a yoke if you want one. Yeah, I'm not out there saying like, no one should be able to use a yoke. It's too dangerous. Hey, and if you like the option of yokes or steering wheels, hit the like button and help support the show by spreading it to more people. So we've heard Elon say it a lot. Full self-driving should be coming soon. In fact, at the latest Tesla Q1 2023 earnings call, he said Tesla expects to have full autonomy by the end of this year. Well, he said he expected, he hoped <laughs> to have it, but we get it. He's been talking about a self-driving car coming for a few years. Yeah, in 2013, he told German newspaper Die Welt that he believed Tesla would be capable of building a self-driving car within three years. Well, Tesla did build a car with self-driving hardware in 2016. Sure, but he also predicted in 2015 that a Tesla would showcase a self-driving car going from LA to New York within two years. So people have gotten pretty jaded to Elon's proclamations. But not Kathy Wood and her crew of analysts at ARK Invest. They own over a billion dollars in Tesla stock and they are bullish. Yeah, ARK just updated their Tesla price model and put a $2,000 per share price target on Tesla, which is a big upside from its current $160 per share price. Now, we test full self-driving all the time and we are both amazed by what it can do. And we're also rather harsh critics of what it does wrong. That. That a lot. That sucked. That would have been a T-bone. That would have f***ing, we, ah, that. But I think we can now all agree on one thing. Cars will be able to drive themselves autonomously better than humans. I think the only debate is when. 
Arc stated in its latest report, Arc has grown increasingly confident that Tesla will launch a robo-taxi service soon. Our updated Monte Carlo model includes a range of launch dates with late 2024 as the weighted average of all cases as shown below. So Arc is predicting the following. The strongest case seems to be for robo-taxi to start next year with a 33% chance according to Arc's analysis. And I want to say, I agree with their assessment, and I'm basing it on exponential curves. When FSD beta was rolled out to early beta testers in October 2020, it could barely handle a couple of blocks without an intervention. An intervention-free trip was rare. But now, just two and a half years later, an intervention-free trip is common. Yeah, if we graph it, the improvement has been astounding. And remember what we don't see, the training on supercomputers. Tesla has continually been improving its hardware and software, and I think it's safe to say Tesla arguably has the best autonomy team in the world. It is incredible what the cars can do now. Are they perfect yet? No. But I do think they are approaching the line of as good as the average human driver, and they will continue to improve past that line on an exponential curve so that soon after passing that achievement, they will drive twice as good as the average human driver, and then three times better. And they tell two friends, and they tell their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. At about that point, regulators will have no choice but to permit this technology on public roads. To not do so will be considered ethically wrong because Teslas will be safer than humans. So it comes back to when will this happen, and I think there's a really good chance this will happen next year. What do you think? Let us know in the comments below. Ford Motor CEO Jim Farley just came out with some advice for Elon in an article in Insider. Quote, Go read 1913. This has all happened before. I think what he's going to learn is product freshness means a lot. The product gets commoditized and then you lose your pricing premium. That's a really dangerous thing. Okay, so let's just break this down a bit. Well, first of all, there are a couple books titled 1913. There's Charles Emerson's book, 1913, In Search of the World Before the Great War, and Florian Illy's book, 1913, The Year Before the Storm. So I'm not sure which book Farley is referring to, but if his point is that in 1913, Henry Ford became a mass producer of cars and that almost all of his competition went out of business, then point taken. That is what is happening now, 110 years later. Tesla is becoming the mass producer of electric cars and putting all of their competition out of business. Ford made a rather boring car, the Model T, starting in 1908, and it took 19 years before Ford came out with a new model, the Model A, in 1927. By 1919, Ford had produced 3.4 million cars. So, Jim, I think that Elon knows what he's doing. He made a quality car, better than any of his competition in terms of features, ride, acceleration, software, comfort, charging speed, charging network, safety, and price. You can say all the pithy things you want about what Elon should be doing. I would offer you some advice. How about you start working on producing better EVs, more EVs, cheaper EVs, and spend less time telling Elon what he should do. Since, by the way, you just lost your second place EV sales status to GM, of all companies. GM sold twice as many EVs in Q1 as Ford did. Oh, and also when it comes to freshness, if, if only there was like some big, new, really fresh designed mm. car that Tesla was like about to come out with, like maybe this year. Yeah, I mean, it, it, maybe maybe uh, Jim Farley's right. You know, if, if only Tesla could come out with something that was going to be so groundbreaking and breaking the mold and fresh. Um, but I, I just don't know what that could be. What, you don't think the Ford line up there looks fresh? <laughs> well, let's dust off the Mustang brand and we'll put it on an SUV and then we'll, we'll, we'll take the Ford Lightning. It looks just like the other Lightning. And then we'll take the Transit van, which looks like every other Transit van in the world. So let us know what you think. Does Tesla need to freshen up to stay competitive? Or is it the Model T? So, Jesse, take a look at this chart from GM about everything that the Chevy Bolt has accomplished. Aw, that's great, GM. I mean, look at that. 75% of Bolt owners came from non-GM vehicles. It's the highest conquest rate of any GM vehicle. And 80% of Bolt owners would buy another Chevy. That's one of the highest loyalty rates in the industry. Wow, GM, you knocked it out of the park with the Bolt. And GM announced last week that they will stop producing Bolts by the end of the year. Wait, what? What? No, I mean, I mean, GM already killed the Volt for some stupid reason. Um, are you sure you didn't mix this up with... The Volt? Because the Volt is dead. We, we don't have the Volt. You're now saying the b b b b bolt with a B-B? Wait, did you say Volt or Bolt? I said Volt, and then you said Bolt. Which one looks like the Chevy Malibu? No, but seriously, so the Bolt. They're canceling the Bolt. 
I mean, the Bolt was the best-selling non-Tesla EV in Q1 here in the United States with almost 20,000 sold, and they're going to just cancel it? Well, it's going to be a big year for GM. Mary Barra claims they're going to produce 50,000 EVs in North America in the first half of this year, 2023, and produce 100,000 in the second half of this year. But GM only sold 968 Cadillac Lyrics in Q1 and only two GMC Hummer EVs. Is that going to get them to the 150,000 EVs this year? No, no. Uh, GM's going to start delivering the Chevy Silverado EV pickup truck in Q2 to the first 340 fleet customers and then ramp production in the second half of this year. So that'll be fun to look forward to because we're getting our Silverado this year. Then the Chevy Blazer EV is launching this summer. And then the Equinox EV is launching in the fall. Get it? Equinox. Oh, OK. Yeah. Fall. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Good job, GM. Uh, GM plans to produce 1 million EVs annually in North America by 2025. So I guess that those are the two big questions for me. How well will these new GM EV models sell? And probably more importantly, can GM actually produce them in any meaningful quantities? Well, GM does have four battery cell plants in North America. They're targeting 160 gigawatt hour capacity, and they just revealed plans for a $3 billion cell factory in partnership with Samsung. So we'll just have to wait and see if 2023 is the big year that Mary Barra is promising. I'm serious, you led. It started in Europe. Then the US, now China. What are we talking about? Tesla has started opening its supercharger network up to non-Tesla EVs. Tesla just announced this pilot program. They're opening 10 supercharger locations in China, five in Beijing and five in Shanghai to non-Tesla EVs to be able to charge. Yeah, 37 different electric models, including Neo, Xpeng, BYD, and Polestar can now charge at these 10 supercharger locations. So does Tesla have to install the magic dock? No, not in China. The Tesla supercharger network uses the Chinese standard connector. So it's kind of like how CCS is used throughout Europe. So opening the superchargers in China is just a software thing. So as of today, there are 1,675 supercharger locations throughout China and over 10,000 stalls. So does this mean that if the pilot program goes well, that Tesla will open all these locations to non-Tesla EVs? I mean, how will that work? Well, reading through their announcement, translated from Chinese, uh, it will work the same as in Europe and the US. A non-Tesla EV driver would download the Tesla app and initiate and pay for charging through the app. And because everything is software controlled, Tesla can control how many stalls are available at any given time to non-Tesla EVs because it's all controlled with software. Exactly. And this is a very important point to all the Tesla owners out there who are like, well, I don't like this. Our superchargers are going to get clogged up with Polestars and Neos and Chevy Lyrics. First, I say, don't worry, GM will never sell enough Lyrics to clog anything. But seriously. Tesla can continuously monitor the supercharger network and keep enough stalls available at each location for Teslas. And this can be done dynamically. At any given moment, Tesla can look at the data and decide to open a couple more stalls over here or close a few over there to keep things humming. They can also use predictive models because Tesla has all the data about charging usage. And here's the big point that I think so many people are missing because for the longest time, Tesla's supercharger network was just this nice thing. It's not a nice thing. It's a huge profit center. We've typically been, how should I say this politely, very negative about other charging networks like Electrify America, Ionity, ChargePoint, Blink, and EVgo. Is it because they largely suck? Yes. Yes! Yes, yes they do. But also from a financial perspective, because they suck, they don't make much money. It's like a bad restaurant chain. It's not that we don't like food. It's that we don't like badly run restaurant chains. But Tesla has a spectacular high speed charging network and it will be highly profitable because number one, the number of EVs on the roads are growing fast. Number two, Tesla has locations pretty much everywhere. And number three, Tesla has the best uptime in the industry so people can trust that they'll work when they arrive needing a charge. It's like Tesla was the first to open a global gas station network back in the middle of the last century. Yeah, it'll become a profit generator for Tesla immediately because they were already building superchargers anyway. Let that sink in. By the way, I did some back of the napkin math on how much money Tesla could make on the supercharger network. It'll take too long to break it down here, but we'll be sharing that on Patreon bonus stories this week. So support us on Patreon and get access to all of our Patreon bonus stories.
By the way, in China, Tesla also has 700 destination charger locations with over 2,000 destination charger plugs. Yeah. So in Cybertruck news, Tesla just reopened ordering for the Cybertruck. Remember, for the longest time, uh, they closed it. So now you can uh, order if you haven't gotten a chance to order before or if you want to add a few more to your orders. <laughs> well, that's really good news. Yeah. But also check this out. Uh, Sawyer Merritt posted these pictures of Cybertruck spotted testing near Fremont factory. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't like it. What's the matter? Look at it. <laughs> it looks like the Cybertruck. No, it doesn't. It's not the Cybertruck I wanted. No. Um, yeah, lots of complainers about Cybertruck these days. Every time there's a picture that comes out, everyone's like, wait a minute. Look at the front end. Wait a minute. It's that's shorter than that's I remember. That's not what I wanted. It's rounder. That's, I think that looks different. I'm not buying it now. I think it looks ugly now. I, yeah. I never saw it in the sunlight from that angle before. Like with the with the bike rider uh, next to it, it doesn't look as good as yeah. I thought. Yeah, and Elon replied CGI IRL, um, which is what he says all the time. Now I I do want to just talk about it. Um, the Cybertruck. Well, let me talk about the Ford for a second. We've been driving the Ford Lightning. Okay. Um, and it's a pickup truck, mm -hmm. and I like it mm -hmm. because it's a pickup truck. <laughs> that's the that's it. That's the only reason. Yeah, you, I like the Ford you used at it all. Over the weekend, to use the bed. Yeah, you know? I was using it. I was driving stuff around, right. doing truck things. Right. I don't like the UI. Oh, I don't like I don't I like know. the charging network. I don't like the other day I got in the truck and um and the the screen showed a Mach E in the top left hand corner. Well it's trying to sell you one, you know. Uh but I was like, um, should I be worried? You know, like so anyway, I don't like the Ford based on anything other than it being electric and being a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. So having a cyber truck, I don't care what it looks like. Maybe I'm the only one who doesn't care what my truck looks like. But it you don't think it looks cool? It does look cool. And I and I'm glad that it's dent proof and rust proof and all that other stuff. But I don't know. Maybe maybe there's just a, a very vocal minority on the internet who just loves to nitpick little you know things. What? I think there's a percentage of Americans, it's pretty large nowadays, who thinks of a vehicle as an extension of like their jewelry or their clothes. Instead of it being a thing that just gets you around, now everyone's just like, you know, look at my oh, I just don't don't touch my car. It's a freaking car, okay? Yeah. It's supposed to get you around. Yeah. I mean, if it looks good, great, but like, well, and I also want to just, I just want to remember this. Remember when the Model 3 was coming out mm -hmm. and just, it was article after article. Oh, I remember this. Comment yeah. after comment of like, well, if it doesn't have a binnacle, I'm not buying it. I will not buy that car if it doesn't have a instrument cluster. No, I if remember. If it doesn't have a heads up display, yep. just forget it. I, I wanted to go EV, but because it doesn't have this one thing, I'm not going to buy it. And I, we were just where, like, where do those like, people go? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I would love to see the, those people are definitely driving a Model 3 now. Of course they yeah, are. Yeah. Look, if you want to talk all about the Cybertruck for hours and hours, go over to the Cybertruck Owners Club. They help sponsor the show. They've got all the community talk about everything. That's where we find a lot of our data about what's going on with Cybertruck. So head on over there now. Whoa, that's actually kind of light. Yeah, it's a uh, carbon fiber. Zach and I just reviewed one of the lightest e-bikes that we've ever had the privilege to ride. The Utopia Carbon One. Yeah, I didn't know that we'd ever get to ride a carbon fiber e-bike because I thought they'd be too expensive. I was seriously surprised that they figured out how to make an e-bike frame out of carbon fiber for such a low price. We won't tell you the price here. You'll have to go watch our review on the Nalitz Review Channel to find out. Uh, that's only fair, I think, because we put a lot of time and effort into our Nalitz Review Channel. And the only way we can keep doing it is if we get people like you to watch our videos and subscribe. So we'll put a link down below and make it easier for you. I don't think that most people would have any idea that the Utopia Carbon One is an e-bike. Mm. I mean, look at it. They hid the battery so well in that slender frame. And we cover all the specs in our review. And I think this would be a great choice for all of those hardcore road bikers out there who've been like feeling a little left out of the e-bike revolution. But we're like, I'm not getting on a clunky e-bike. Yeah. Kudos to the folks at Utopia for pulling it off. And if you want to talk about e-bikes and scooters and micromobility until your head falls off, then join us at Micromobility Europe 2023. This is going to be a really fun in-person event in Amsterdam on June 8th and 9th. Yeah, you're going to be able to ride on small electric vehicles, learn how to create more livable urban areas and build a more sustainable world. We'll put the link to that below as well. You can check out the early bird prices. Uh, they keep going up. So the sooner you buy tickets, the more you save. And you'll get 20% off the ticket price now if you use our code down below. And if you want to join us in October in California for Micromobility America, that's going to be a lot of fun too. And you can get your tickets down below as well with the discount. So if you didn't see our in-depth last Friday, 
and you drive an EV, or even just know someone who drives an EV, then you should watch it. Not only was it fun to watch me get scared out of my mind by a guy in a hockey mask, but I'm actually really proud of our wonderful community. Yeah, we heard about a problem one day while talking to the Wisconsin Tesla Owners Club. Uh, we presented the problem to you and we actually got solutions. We're talking about the fact that when you're plugged into an EV charger, you can't drive away under any circumstances unless you physically unplug first. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a bear or a guy in a hockey mask or a fire, you have to get out of your EV and unplug it in order to drive away until now. Really, go watch our in-depth right here. But if you want the shortcut, go buy this from our friends at EVject who solved the problem. Because we've been working with them to get them to extend a 30% discount to our community. So make sure that you use our link and code now you know 30. And if you want to find out even more, then go watch our full interview with EVject's founder and executive chairman Craig Peeler on our disruptive investing channel. So Arroyo, a a row. Iro, arrow, arrow, arrow has unveiled their pickup truck. Mm. What are you doing? Oh, you said pickup truck, so I have to go pre-order one. Um, I'm not sure this one quite fits into the same category as the Lightning and the Rivian. You don't think it's going to qualify for the Hummer tax credit? No, it's an electric mini truck, the Vanish. It seats two and can carry up to 1,200 pounds, although this is an LSV. Oh, that's a low speed vehicle, meaning it can only go 25 miles an hour. Right. So, I mean, I can see how this could be used on a campus, but 25 miles an hour is a bit limiting for delivery or other on road activities. I mean, I almost feel like the LSV regulation was designed to kill stuff like this. It's just too slow to take it on the road with any confidence. Well, Aero said that there will be a non LSV version mm -hmm. uh, on their website. So maybe you could get a slightly faster one. Yeah, I feel like 35 or 40 miles an hour could actually make it safer because traffic wouldn't have to slow down or pass you. What do you think of the Vanish? Well, how much does it cost? Uh, we don't know for sure, but possibly $25,000. Sheesh. I mean, I think you can get cheaper mini pickup trucks, either a K truck for like a couple grand or one of those Chinese EV mini pickups. You said K truck for a couple grand. What's that? It's like this Japanese truck. Uh, you've just been able to start importing them and like they cost like a thousand dollars in Japan, but then you have to export them to the United States. They run on gas and I'm not saying that oh. they're a one to one Ew. comparison, but a lot of people um, are getting really excited about them because they're for the first time they're actually able to import them. Um, this is an electric version of that um, and in many ways is much, much better. But I think. I don't know. In terms of price, uh, there's a big discrepancy there. In terms of total cost of ownership, I think this might win in the long run. Yeah, but service. I think if you're a campus, like a college campus, this might look attractive for, you know, your groundskeeping and stuff like that. But then you're going to be worried about like, OK, when it does break or I need a part, like, where do I go? And I don't know that Arrow has a service network. Right. I mean, they are in Texas. So instead of having to, you know, import parts, I guess, from Japan, from a very popular truck, um, you'd have to, yeah, hope that uh, Aero stays in business. So we reported a few years ago now, back in 2018, on Walter Huang, the Apple engineer who died when his Tesla Model X hit a highway barrier in Mountain View, California, while driving to work. Investigators did find that his Model X was in autopilot and did drive into the median divider. And because there was no crash attenuator, it had been destroyed by a previous crash a few months earlier and never replaced. The crash was even more severe. Investigators found that according to phone data, Huang was playing a game on his phone at the time of the accident. The Wang family decided to sue Tesla, arguing that Elon's comments about autopilot and self-driving may have led Wang to believe he could drive in the manner that he did. Tesla offered up a defense saying that Elon should not have to be made available for questioning in the trial because some of the statements that Huang may have heard may have been deepfakes. OK, so for those of you who don't know what deepfakes are, can you explain that to them? So these are computer generated um, fake uh, versions of somebody saying something that they've never said. Yeah, check out this video of uh, The Last of Us replacing the actor's faces with other people's faces. I mean, it's it's astounding how you if you didn't know those actors, you'd think those were the actors. Or, I mean, here's a worse, honestly, deep fake of, of Elon saying something that he would never say. Personally, I think what needs to happen now is we LS swap all our Teslas and rockets. We already changed our name to Tess LS. 
we have a plane ready to fly over to China and load up turbochargers. My head of engineering is taking a U-Haul to every junkyard within a 100-mile radius. So Judge Evett D. Pennypacker wasn't buying Tesla's deep fake defense, saying this in her ruling. Their position is that because Mr. Musk is famous and might be more of a target for deepfakes, his public statements are immune. In other words, Mr. Musk and others in his position can simply say whatever they like in the public domain, then hide behind the potential for their recorded statements being a deepfake to avoid taking ownership of what they did actually say and do. Now, I actually don't believe that's what Tesla's defense was saying, Judge Pennypacker. I believe Tesla was saying, we don't know what Walter Wang may have watched to give him the idea that Teslas can be driven without paying attention. Elon certainly never said anything like that, and the cars themselves don't say that. They actually very clearly state, always pay attention to the road. Judge Pennypacker has ruled that Elon must make himself available for up to three hours of deposition in the trial. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, Tesla is going to lose the trial. This is about one specific point about a trial. The news loves to take this and yeah. turn it into Elon is a jerk and uh, you can't trust true Tesla. But, you know, whatever. What do you think of this defense? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And I just want to say that we learned back in 2020 from the National Transportation Safety Board documents released on this crash that according to the Wang family's attorney, quote, Walter said the car would veer toward the barrier in the mornings when he went to work. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the car was dangerous because it would try to veer into things and then use as your defense that you didn't know that the car wasn't designed to let you drive while you played video games. I'm sorry. It's tragic when anyone is killed in an accident. But also, in my opinion, people who don't follow the rules are also endangering others. We're living in an age where so many people want to blame someone else for their actions. So own your actions. Actions have consequences. And speaking of lawsuits, Tesla and Dutch charging company Fastned are suing the German gas station operator Tank and Rast for the right to install EV chargers along the German Autobahn. Tank and Rast was a state-owned company up until 1998, when Tank and Rast was privatized by the German government, but it seems that they have maintained quite a monopoly, as they are pretty much the only concession at rest stops along the German highway system. Last Thursday, the Dusseldorf Higher Regional Court started hearing whether this monopoly that Tank and Rast has would extend to EV charging. Because so far, Tank and Rast has installed very little EV charging, and it has only allowed ENBW, German company, MER, German company, Ionity, German company, and Eon Energy, a German company, to operate chargers on its properties. Hmm. hmm, That's funny. So let me get this straight. The German government used to own all the gas and diesel stations along the Autobahn. Then they privatized it into one big monopoly, and that monopoly decided to exclude companies like Tesla and Fastned from installing EV chargers. Hmm. That's so interesting. I wonder if that has anything to do with German big auto or big oil. I wonder. I don't know. I wonder. Hey, if you want to share a story you've seen on Tesla Time News this week, but you don't want to share the entire episode, go to our Now You Know Clips channel, where we chop into little bite-sized clips that you can easily share with friends. So we just got the latest data from the second largest car rental company in the world by fleet size, Hertz Global Holdings. During their Q1 2023 earnings call, Hertz reported having 50,000 EVs in their fleet. Okay, but I'm confused because Hertz reported having 48,344 EVs in their fleet at the end of last year. So that's only about 1,600 more EVs. And also Hertz reported that they took delivery in February of half of its 100,000 Tesla order. Maybe it's because most of those Teslas were for Uber drivers. Uh, so maybe Hertz doesn't count them as being in their fleet for like rental customers. By the way, who is the biggest rental car company if Hertz is second? Oh, Enterprise. Uh, they have a fleet of about 1.1 million cars versus Hertz that has about half that. Last year, the U.S. car rental industry, by the way, had a market size of $54 billion. There were 29.2 million cars rented in the U.S. in 2021. And I think that this is another reason why Tesla is going to dominate. As Hertz CEO Stephen Schur said during the earnings call, our continued investment in the business, particularly in the areas of technology and electrification, are improving our operational cadence, extending our reach in rideshare and enabling the revitalization of our value brands. Right. Let's read between the lines there. In Q1, Hertz had revenue of $2 billion, up 13% year over year. So EVs mean less maintenance, a longer road life, and their customers get to spend less on gas, and therefore Hertz makes a higher profit margin when renting EVs. So do Teslas make up most of Hertz's fleet? 
Yes, uh, mainly Tesla Model 3s to start, but then Hertz added a big order of Model Ys. Hertz also just ordered 65,000 Polestar 2s and 175,000 GM cars. But here's the thing, ordering cars and actually getting them delivered are two different things. Right, Tesla can actually fill big orders. GM and Polestar cannot. And as Hertz's competitors also want to start adding EVs to their fleets, well, you can see where this is going. Tesla's going to be selling a lot more cars. Exactly. And here's the thing. In the rental market, you have to keep your fleet looking very new, right? You know, your customers getting into like a 2005 Chevy Malibu. But the thing about Tesla's is because they don't change their looks very often, they don't look older. So you can keep the cars in your fleet longer versus ICE models where, you know, every year matters and you have to resell them. Hmm. And that's the other part here. Rental companies do resell their cars like after a couple of years and EVs retain their value. So when you do go to sell them, you get a much higher return rate. So the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, has unanimously passed its Advanced Clean Fleets, or ACF rule, which requires all new medium and heavy duty vehicles sold or registered in the state of California to be zero emission from 2036. The rule will complement CARB's previous Advanced Clean Trucks rule adopted in 2020. The ACF will require commercial fleet operators to purchase a certain percentage of electric trucks, while the previous ACT regulation required that manufacturers supply enough electric trucks. The rule will allow vehicles to continue being used throughout their typical useful life, but there are milestones that are sooner than the 2036 target. For example, and this is huge, state and local agencies must purchase 50% zero emission vehicles by 2024 and 100% zero emission vehicles by 2027. This is also a big deal as California has two giant ports, uh, drayage vehicles, which are those transport cargo trucks from that go from ports to distribution centers. Those must reach 100 percent all electric purchases by 2024 next year. CARB expects that nearly half of all semi trucks that travel on its highways will be zero emissions by 2035 and about 70 percent will be zero emissions by 2042, with the eventual goal of 100 percent by 2045. California is the world's fifth biggest economy and a major car market and has very much influence on policy in other U.S. states, sending a signal to manufacturers to be ready for a zero emissions future. So if you've been watching TTN for a while, then you know that Jesse and I love electric school buses. We think that they're the future for transporting kids to school. Cleaner than diesel. Yeah, let's keep those IQ points in kids' heads, okay? Diesel pollution has a direct impact on lungs and brains. And electric school buses like these from Lion Electric in Canada's Prince Edward Island can also be used to plug into the grid and power buildings when the power goes out. Like it did last year when Hurricane Fiona with its 150 kilometer an hour winds knocked out 95% of the island's power. The province opened up warming centers like this one at the North Rustico Lions Club in the town of North Rustico with a population of 648. They had to run a diesel generator day and night to keep the building warm. But now with a pilot program with Lion Electric, which is based in Canada, the province has ordered 200 electric Lion school buses, 82 of which will be up and running by the end of May. The province will no longer have to use diesel generators to stay warm when the power goes out. An electric bus will plug in and power the warming centers. And this is something that we talked about in our Magic School Bus episode uh, years and years ago. We said, oh, what? What it is it? Was just, what, what is it, Father? It was just three words. And it was electric school buses. We said, hey, if you have these big drivable batteries, you could drive them to like places in like emergencies and plug them in. And you might be saying, well, what happens when all the energy from those buses goes away? Well, you could kick on the diesel generator, but instead of just running it at like, you know, low power mode to try and, you know, just heat the building and keep the lights on, you could run it at its peak efficiency, charge the batteries in the bus back up, and then turn the generator off let the batteries run down and then repeat the process, which mm. is going to save you on diesel fuel, which not only saves money, but if you can't get to that warming center to mm -hmm. replenish the diesel fuel, it'll actually last longer because you're increasing the efficiency. Mm. All right, it's time for the lightning round. All we right. brought it back. Mercedes-Benz is offering an optional pay-to-play performance upgrade called Acceleration Increase for North American drivers of its EQE and EQS EVs, which can increase horsepower and zero to 60 times through an over-the-air update. The optional upgrade, which ranges from $60 to $90 per month or $600 to $900 per year, is available through the Mercedes Me Connect store and does not affect a given EV's range. 
The Texas House has passed a bill, 145 to nothing, to charge EV owners a $200 annual fee, which is higher than the average $71 per year paid by gas-powered cars. The bill now goes to Governor Greg Abbott's desk for final approval. And Gail Alfar said, we pay taxes on electricity. And Elon said, exactly. So to the Texas House bill, go f*** yourself. Chinese autonomous mobility company Pony AI has been granted a permit to allow robo-taxis to operate in Guangzhou without a safety officer present in the vehicle. The permit follows similar permissions in Beijing and enables 17 robo-taxis to operate in the Nansha district of Guangzhou. So check this out, Jesse. Lucid Motors has begun public road testing of its Gravity SUV in the U.S. Wow. You don't seem very impressed by gravity. Yeah. Lucid said the SUV, which is expected to launch in 2024, will include seating for seven passengers and deliver more electric range than any SUV on the market. Okay, well, I'm sorry. It's going to take a little bit more than a 15-second nothing burger of a video to excite me. Public roads! All right, it's time for Going Green. How'd you like to move to Arizona? Why? Well, you like e-bikes, right? Yeah. Well, if you move to cul-de-sac Tempe, a car-free rental apartment community in Tempe, Arizona, they're giving each resident a free e-bike. Wow. Uh, we reviewed the Electrek 2 folding e-bike on Now Let's Review, um, and they're based in Phoenix, Arizona, right? Yeah, so the partnership kind of makes sense. So what else does cul-de-sac Tempe offer? Well, they started construction last year. That was the site on the left before construction got underway, and that is where they're at now on the right. Okay, so I see that there will be over 700 apartments on this 17-acre site with an acre of amenities because they don't need to build any car parking lots. Right, so you get things like over 50 shared courtyards with two miles of bike lanes and zero asphalt. So I guess the question is, is this the community of the future? It could be, because even if you're saying out there, well, there'll always be cars. Yeah, but if they're robo taxis and they don't need to park there mm. and they just pick people up and drop them off, then you can get rid of all that parking space. Like go to your local apartment complex, right? And walk around or drive around and you're going to just see parking everywhere. They right. have to have tons and tons, like there'll be little garages and parking spaces and parking lots. And it's like all that doesn't need to be there anymore. You can have more fun stuff. You can have parks and, and restaurants and markets and bike paths. Hmm. All right, it's time for Sunspots. We report on new solar, wind and battery projects being built pretty much every week. And it's great. It makes you feel really good. The world is getting cleaner energy. But what good are all those projects if they can't plug into the electrical power grid? What I'm talking about is this. On the left was the queue for electric generation projects in the U.S. in 2010, compared with what was already installed on the grid. So as you can see, almost 1,000 gigawatts was already installed, and about 500 gigawatts of projects were waiting to get the proper interconnect permits to join the grid. Now on the right here, we fast forward to 2022. 1,250 gigawatts of installed generation and 2,020 gigawatts waiting for the green light. Look at all that solar, wind, and storage just waiting to be added. Yeah, 1,300 gigawatts of clean power and 670 gigawatts of battery storage. Now, I hear what you might be saying. Zach and Jesse, this is good news. All these renewable energy projects in the queue, it's just a matter of a few weeks and maybe a couple months, and bam, we're gonna have so much renewable energy on the grid. Well, unfortunately, this queue is not moving that fast. According to the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, the average new power generation project took 35 months to go from the interconnection request being filed with the grid operator to getting the green light. That's almost three years? Yep. So here's a map of the different grid operators in the US and the queues for different projects waiting for permission to join the grid. Blue is storage of batteries, yellow is solar, green is wind, and gray is gas. But as you can see, that pretty much nobody is building gas plants anymore. Many of the projects give up because it takes so long. So look at this chart of the percentage of projects between 2000 and 2017 that actually made it to completion. Wow. That's just a small fraction. I mean, why is this taking so long? Well, that's a great question. So after doing some research, it seems like it's two things if you believe the utilities. One, because the lines have gotten so long, many energy developers file for permits all over the country to see which projects will move the fastest. And in many cases, they don't actually build the projects even when they get the green light. Utilities are claiming that this is gumming up the works. Number two, utilities say that the grid just isn't ready for all this new power. There just aren't enough transmission lines. 
So why don't they just um, do a couple things? Number one, change the rules about filing for permits you won't need. And number two, build more transmission lines. Well, in my opinion, it's because that's not the real problem. What's the real problem? Utilities don't have much incentive to bring these new projects online. Much easier to just drag your feet because what will happen when new renewable energy comes online? practically free energy from the sun and wind. And the utilities will lose revenue. Exactly. We've seen it play out all across the U.S. already. When homeowners put solar on their roofs in many parts of the country, the longest part of the process isn't the design of the new system or the physical work it takes to install the panels. It's the permit process. And if you're like, well, it's not fair. Where are the utilities supposed to get the money to build new more transition lines? The utilities collect millions of dollars per project in connection fees, and that's supposed to go towards building more infrastructure, and they get paid by you, the ratepayer. Take a look at your monthly bill, right there. Transmission charge and distribution charge lines. And this is generally the time in the story where it just looks bleak and where I just wanna stop thinking about this and go take a nap, but we shouldn't because that's what they want us to do. They want us to throw our hands up and go, well, I guess there's nothing we can do. Look, you have more power than you think. Pun intended. Two things you can do right now. Number one, don't stand for it. Get upset enough to educate yourself and tell your government on the federal level, that's the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, link down below. On the state level, that's your state utilities commission. And the next time a politician asks for your vote, tell them you'll consider giving it to them if they tell you what their position is on connecting renewables to the grid. Okay, and what's the second thing they can do? If you're able to, become your own solar generator and battery storage project. And if you have questions, I'm sure you do, reach out to our friends at EnergyPal. They'll help you figure out the best system for you. Tell them Zach and Jesse sent you. The link is down below. Meanwhile, in China, take a look at this. Wow, what am I looking at? That is just the first phase of the China Desert Solar and Wind Farm Project being installed at the edge of the Gobi Desert in the Tenager Desert in China's Ningzhua Wei Autonomous Region. You are looking at one gigawatt of solar panels. Wait, that's just the first phase? How big will this be when it's done? China started building this in just 2021, and the total project will cost $12.2 billion and will have a total capacity of 13 gigawatts when it's done. What you're looking at here makes 1,800 gigawatt hours of electricity every year, enough to power 1.5 million households. Wait, so it's going to get to be 13 times bigger when it's done? I think so. Wow. I mean, this really gives perspective from our last story about U.S. utility companies dragging their feet versus China, which is embracing renewable technology and building the necessary infrastructure to collect free energy every day. And that's the key word there, free. Utilities don't want to do this because it's free. They just like that. Oh, business model doesn't work if free. All right, it's time for a video contributor stories. Remember, we need your story. Send them to hello at now, you know, channel.com. It's real simple. Couple minutes, shoot them in horizontal and let's see what we got this week. Hi, Zach and Jesse. It's Jim and Rick from central Minnesota. In 150 years, this is the eighth snowiest on record. And as of this recording, we still have the last half of March, April and May to get more. We bought a Toro PowerMax E24 60-volt snowblower. It comes with two 60-volt 7.5-amp batteries and two charging stations. Three batteries can be plugged into the E24. The total of the three batteries must add up to 6 amps to run the snowblower. Toro does sell battery-operated yard tools that come with lower-amp batteries that can be used in the E24. The time of operation of the snowblower depends on the depth of the snow, the type of snow, the number and size of batteries plugged in. We have been getting around 30 minutes of operation in heavy wet snow to 45 minutes in dry light snow with two 7.5 amp and one 2 amp batteries. There is an eco mode that is supposed to help extend the charge of the batteries. According to the manual, Eco lowers the speed of the blades and lessens the throw distance. Battery charge time is around two hours on the larger seven and a half amp batteries. The opportunity for improvement for Toro is there's no warning when the batteries are about to lose power. It is not as easy as it probably should be to clean the snow away from the snow chute prior to storing the snowblower. My 
opinion is I like it. It's not anywhere near as loud as a gas engine. I don't stink of exhaust fumes. And I am not OCD, so it doesn't matter to me if I don't finish all the snow clearing at once. Now you know. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, now, I know that everyone's like, well, it's springtime. I don't have to think about the snow. Um, this is usually when you get good deals on snowblowers. That's true. That's true. Uh, I hate to say <laughs> to like prepare now, be that, you know, be the squirrel and the Aesop's fable or whatever. But, you know, get get ready now with your battery operated snowblower. Maybe use the batteries on some other lawn exactly. equipment. And uh, no, that's the beauty of the system is if you, you know, you have to kind of pick a brand, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But then once you do, you can use them on the weed whackers, on the you know lawnmowers and all that. All right, it's time for Patreon bonus stories. We got so many stories this week. You know, sometimes on shows like late shows, they're like, uh, and we got a show for you. We have got Investor Club bonus stories. We have got Patreon bonus stories. And over on our Disruptive Investing channel, we've got a story for you, too. So this is just amazing. Go check it out. Uh, we'll see you in a minute. Wow, we're back from our Patreon bonus stories. That was insane. It's time for our Patreon shout outs. Who do we got this week? We've got Ron Eggleston, Keith Bandolin, Roger Schubert, Nils Brennan, and John Paul Choate. Thank you so much for supporting us. We can't do this work without you. All right, we had a poll this week. What was the question for uh, our patrons? Do you agree with Jim Farley that Tesla needs to freshen up their lineup? What did they say? And 81% of people said no. I'm pretty sure Tesla's designs are still fresh or at least still look fresher than what Ford is putting out. 12% said yes, they uh, have to update their designs. Interesting. All right, it's time for Elon's tweets of the week. And Paul Graham said, median household income in the United States by ethnic group. Wow. Elon said, interesting. I did not know that. That, that is, is interesting. Yeah. Matt Allen says, Elon, do you believe that Twitter creators will be able to make as much as YouTube creators in the future? Elon said, more. Ooh. So. Sir Merritt said, new. SpaceX and Tesla again ranked number one and number two is the most desirable place to work for engineers. Elon said, yay. <laughs> Uh, Elon had tweeted, going to create a site where the public can rate the core truth of any article and track the credibility score over time of each journalist, editor, and publication, thinking of calling it Pravda. That was back in 2018. Now he said, or maybe just X. Hmm, what we're saying is coming true. John Ehrlichman said, years in which these films were set. Elon said, Wally has a decent runway. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Another it's like, 600 years. Yeah. <laughs> Cameron Winklevoss says, the original blue check mark was about status. The new blue check mark is about utility. If you don't believe in its utility, then don't pay for it and quietly move on. But please stop whining about it. You are signaling that you prefer status games to a level playing field. Elon said, exactly. Yeah. And boy, am I tired of hearing about it. Uh, Elon tweeted this out. My favorite childhood memory is my back not hurting. <laughs> That's mine, too. Farzad said Twitter is literally a web of human brains connected to each other, exchanging information in real time. Elon said collective consciousness and then went on to say the collective mind that is this platform needs more signal and less noise. Farzad went on to say, what percentage of Twitter can you absorb and process in one minute? One millionth of a percent, maybe less. AI can process 100% of it in seconds and make decisions based on said knowledge. That is impossibly massive capability in an incredibly narrow realm. Apply this to literally everything. Elon says, our meat computers are so slow. Are you getting why he bought Twitter? Alex says, I find it funny how people will pay $9.99 for Netflix, $9.99 for Spotify, and $14.99 for Amazon Prime without a second thought, but are so against paying $8 for a platform they spend most of their day complaining on because Elon Musk is pro-free speech. Ash said, they're just mad that regular people can have a check mark and forcing them to pay for theirs will mean they're on the same level. These people scream about equality, yet when actual equality is put in front of their face, they can't handle it. And Elon responded. Farzad said, future monopoly lawsuits for Tesla just went up, LOL. And this is um, from Steve Levine. He said, missed this. BYD, Tesla's primary global competition, has concluded that full self-driving is basically impossible when you consider human psychological safety needs, ethics, regulation, technology, and application in the industry. And then Elon said, it's been a while since had to intervene. 11.4 is good. Elon said, sometimes when you learn about something, you think you have it. Interesting. So like a disease or something? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> The rabbit hole says no politician is entitled to our blind loyalty. I don't care if it's Trump, Biden, or anyone else. They should have to work to win the American people. Elon Musk, please consider hosting political debates on Twitter. Any candidate that backs out should not be taken seriously. And Elon said, we will do our best to support candidates from all parties so that the public may make the most informed choice. Far too much backroom dealings seems to be happening. 
Paul Graham says, when I was a kid, I genuinely believed that this is where we'd all be living by now. Do kids today have some sci-fi vision of the future or was that just my generation? Elon says the mass and difficulty required to build a space habitat like that is extreme. Far better to have a base on the moon and a city on Mars. The rabbit hole said nearly 20% of Gen Z is LGBT. That's one in five people. Elon said over the past few decades among Western elites, LGBT shifted from ostracism, or worse, to being the cool kids club. Max Tegmark says, humanity's lackadaisical response to the superintelligence threat makes me feel like I'm in the movie Don't Look Up. I just explained why here. Elon said, I've seen quite a few technologies develop, but none with this level of risk. AGI is significantly higher risk than nuclear weapons, in my opinion. Super smart humans have trouble imagining something vastly smarter than themselves. Sorry, Merritt said, welp. Uh, and even though that looks like a vault, I think the story is about how the bolt is going to be a Tesla killer. And Elon responded, said people still don't understand the implications of full self-driving. Nick St. Pierre said there are 14,412,260 people in the Mid Journey Discord server. Elon said, wow. Yan LeCun says, it seems AI doomers need to be spelled out. The hard takeoff scenario is utterly impossible. Elon said, the hard takeoff is already happening. Just zoom out a little. The most fundamental metric, in my opinion, is the ratio of digital compute to biological compute versus time. It looks like a wall. Peter Diamantis says, within five years, it'll become malpractice for a physician to diagnose a patient without an AI advisor in the loop. Elon responded, he said, Kurzweil seems to be right about 2029. Tim Poole said, I think we should ask ourselves why so many young people desperately want to be someone else instead of themselves. Elon said, if you were taught to hate yourself, you will want to be someone else. Elon said, met with Senator Schumer and many members of Congress about artificial intelligence regulation today. That which affects safety of the public has over time become regulated to ensure that companies do not cut corners. AI has great power to do good and evil, better the former. He went on to say, I met with many other senior Democratic Party leaders too, many of whom, including Chuck Schumer, I have known for well over a decade. The Schumer meeting was over an hour. He was kind, thoughtful, and asked insightful questions about AI. This man cares about the American people. I thought Elon was a conservative. Yeah. I thought he only ever voted for Republicans always. One time. Which he only did once, and it wasn't even for president. <laughs> Sorry, Merritt said, here is Elon Musk meeting with the president of South Korea today in Washington, D.C. Elon said, good meeting. And we'll be talking about that in uh, Investor Club bonus stories this week. Chief Nerd said, Tucker Carlson had more views on his first Twitter monologue on Wednesday than all cable news shows for the entire day combined. Tucker on Twitter, 72 million. Cable news combined, 53 million. Elon said, wow. John Carmack said, freedom of speech is not natural for society. Speech has power and reducing the agency of your opponents is an obvious play. I'm happy that it is part of the U.S. Constitution and I support defending it. There is a strong temptation to find just the right amount of free speech, carving out what seems to be clearly harmful. I recognize that such an optimum can exist, but I'm dubious about our ability to stand on exactly the right point on a slippery slope. So I tend to absolutist. Elon said, exactly. Bill Maher said, finally got to talk to the guest I've wanted to have on HBO real time more than any other. Thank you, Elon. Elon says, thanks for having me. Really good interview, by the way. Shibatoshi says, the people who support creators are some of the coolest people in the world. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, patrons. Major software upgrades underway across the board at Twitter, encrypted DMs and other DM upgrades rolling out this week. Yeah, you'll be able to talk to each other encryptedly. Rolling out next month, this platform will allow media publishers to charge users on a per article basis with one click. I wonder who said that? This enables users who would not sign up for a monthly subscription to pay a higher per article price for when they want to read an occasional article. Should be a major win-win for both media orgs and the public. Keith Wood says, Ireland is about to pass one of the most radical hate speech bills yet. Merely possessing hateful material on your devices is enough to face prison time. Not only that, but the burden of proof is shifted to the accused. Elon says, this is a massive attack against freedom of speech. And then Elon retweeted Tesla's tweet that your Tesla can automatically navigate to destination based on your calendar. And Holmar's catalog said, Cruise has an accident every 43,000 miles in driverless operation. FSD Beta has an accident every 3.2 million miles in human supervised operation. Elon said 11.4.1 is promising. And Elon retweeted Tesla's uh, energy efficiency here, showing that the Model Y is the most efficient electric SUV ever built. And uh, I drove here in the Ford this morning and I had an efficiency of 1.8. So miles per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Elon retweeted SpaceX's tweet of the Falcon Heavy launch. You should definitely watch that. It's amazing. And it's now time for Community Mail Time. Community Mail Time. Remember, send your stories into us at hello at nowyouknowchannel.com. What do we got this week? Daniel sent us this picture of a Ford Mach-E being used for ambulance service in London. Do they throw you in the back seat? <laughs> Don't bleed on the back seat, mate. <laughs> Benny spotted this home with a bunch of Teslas. 
Our viewer Kay spotted this Fisker Ocean driving around Corona, California. Frank saw this Rivian R1S in Frisco, Texas. Andre spotted these four white Teslas at a supercharger in Alacer du Sal, Portugal. Neil took this picture of the 18 megawatt solar park in Annapolis, Maryland. Alan spotted this purple pair at the supercharger in Hooksit, New Hampshire. Tim found this Model S at the park and ride area in Hamburg, Germany. Mark spotted this F-150 Lightning in Avon, Colorado. Archie spotted this lime green Model 3 in San Diego, California. Willie spotted this Buzz Lightyear themed Model 3 in Taiwan. Chris spotted this GMC Hummer EV pickup truck at the 2023 Boston Marathon weekend. Nice. All right, it's time for supercharger reviews. And let's go see what we got out there in the world. Hey, Zach and Jesse. Boff here. We're on our way from... California to Florida. This is day three, so our third big leg. We're heading from Wilcox, Arizona, where we are right now at a supercharger, which is at the uh, Holiday Inn Express here. And we're gonna be heading to Fort Stockton. As for this supercharger, I think it's completely awesome. There's uh, eight stalls. It's rated for 150 kilowatts and uh, not really tow accessible, but I'm okay with that because it's a hotel and you're meant to really just kind of unload for the night. So that's what we did, we unhooked. It was a little bit of, of a pain where I ended up putting the trailer, but that, that is what it is. I'm not gonna fault it for that. I'm not gonna fault this charger for that. Um, not a whole lot of stalls, but it's, that's not a big deal either. So if you are uh, towing, or if you're not towing with the Tesla, either way, I would say that this is a solid eight out of 10 charger um, because obviously there's a hotel there, which I'm hoping you've booked. If you haven't, at least you could probably go in and go to the bathroom. Um, I don't know about grabbing a bite or anything like that. So that's why we're at in the eight range. But anyway, I know. Hello, Zach and Jesse. This is Alejandro reporting to you from Naples, Florida. This is a eight stall. 250 kilowatt level three supercharger. And as you can see, it's pretty full. This shopping plaza is extremely convenient because it is very close within a minute or two from the major highway, I-75 in Naples. A major uh, crossroads for people who are traveling from Miami to Tampa and vice versa communicating the east and the west coast areas. This supercharger is located in an excellent shopping mall with a super target, multiple restaurants including fast food and sit down food with a, a Burger King and a Chili's, there's a Panera, there's an ice cream place, there are multiple stores in the area and I think it will be an excellent uh, stop for those who need supercharging. And now you know, I will give this uh, a six out of 10. Thank you guys. Hey, Zach and Jesse, it's uh, Morgan here in Victoria, British Columbia at the Supercharger in Uptown Mall in uh, Victoria, BC. Uh, it's pretty great. There's, I wanna say 12 stalls. It's hard to tell. There's a few behind me here and behind the wall and then a couple more over there. They're only level two. But that's okay because at the Uptown Mall in Victoria, there's tons of shops and uh, all kinds of fun things to do here. Uh, even big stores like Walmart, Best Buy, and tons of boutique stores and coffee shops. So it's pretty great. I'd give this an 8 out of 10, but because it's really the only supercharger uh, in Victoria, in the city of Victoria, I'm going to have to give it a 10 out of 10 because you're kind of stuck with it. Uh, but at least it's in a good spot, in the sort of just outside of downtown and in a good place. Uh, now you know. Hi Zach and Jesse, it's Michael from Melbourne, Australia. I'm at the Oven Supercharger in the Alpine region of northeastern Victoria. Uh, it's uh, on the road to the ski fields in Victoria. It's in the uh, car park of the local pub, which is the Happy Valley Hotel, uh, where you can get counter meals as well as obviously drinks. Uh, it's just down the road from a ski hire place where you can hire chains and snowboards and skis. And it's just down the road from the from Pepo's Farms. Uh, which sell various seeds and grains and nuts. Uh, so it's a pretty good spot. It's a four, four stall supercharger and I'd just give it an eight out of 10. So now you know. Thank you so much for doing supercharger reviews. If you want to check them out, you can see them all on our website. We have a map so you can see exactly where they are in the world. So if you're planning a trip, you can check those out. You can also upload your own supercharger reviews there. The website is still working. And hey, it doesn't matter if one's already been reviewed, review it now, it'll be a new review. All right, we got new superchargers that are in the world. These are the new ones just this week. 
We have the six stall in Shanghai, China. We got another six stall in Shanghai, China. Number 54 in Spain is the eight stall in Mahara Honda, Spain. Number 186 in Canada is the 12th stall in Trenton, Ontario. Number 134 in Florida is the 16th stall at Kissimmee, Florida. Number 43 in Georgia is the 8th stall at Marietta on Roswell Road in Georgia. Number 17 in Alabama is the 8th stall in Gardendale, Alabama. The 3th stall in Beijing, China. The 12th stall in Nanchang, China. The 3th stall in Nanjing, China. The 12th stall in Shenzhen, China. Number 347 in California is the 12th stall in Chowchilla, California. Number 30 in Austria is the 16th stall at Niederdorf, Austria. There's the three stall in Beijing, China. The three stall in Hangzhou, China. The three stall in Chaoqing, China. Number 1675 in China is the three stall in Zebu, China. Number 59 in Virginia is the eight stall in Virginia Beach. Number 166 in Germany is the 19th stall in Brunheim. Oh, that's right near the Gigafactory. Number 47 in Illinois is the 12th stall in Mokina, Illinois. Number 113 in the UK is the 14th stall at Mary Hill. Number 23 in South Carolina is the 12th stall in Greenville. Number 74 in Taiwan is the 6th stall in Taipei, Taiwan. Number 69 in Japan is the 4th stall in Okayama. And number 10 in Singapore, number 2,071 in Asia, and 5,024 in the world is the 2 stall in City Square Mall, Singapore. Nice. And wow, you made it to the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching. A heartfelt thanks if you're one of our Patreon patrons who have been with us for years, or maybe you just joined us. Thank you. Something I don't think I've ever said on the show before. I hand type every name of every Patreon patron into this list that you're seeing here. I do that by hand. And it's not a big thing, but I do it because early on, I realized how important you are to Jesse and my success. And I felt it connected me to you. So it's just a simple act of typing your name and I either say it out loud or in my mind, but you are all special to me. And because you are putting your hard earned money where your mouth is, you are voting with your wallet for independent journalism. News that isn't paid for by corporations, we are supported by individuals like you. So thank you, special people. We will see you next week. Now you know.